Well, good morning. The Lord be with you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. It's so good to be with you on this very special day today. It's Palm Sunday as we begin our Holy Week together. And Shelby, I want to thank you for leading us in worship this morning. Great job today. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> today we are going to read the uh, triumphant entry passage from Mark's Gospel, chapter 11. And we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 11. And how about, let's, y'all want to stand back up for the reading of the gospel? Let's stand back up. Thank you so much. We stand in honor of the gospel reading. Mark 11, verse 1. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. And as they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And then Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. So there is a Palm Sunday weekend that really stands out to me out of most all of them. Does anyone here remember where you were on March the 16th, 2016? Do you remember? Well, I can tell you exactly where I was on that particular day. It was a Saturday and um, I was living in Amory, Mississippi, which is in northeast Mississippi, Monroe County. And that particular Saturday, the town was throwing a parade for someone who was coming home. That person's name was Trent Harmon. Does anybody know who Trent Harmon is? Wow. Y'all don't know who Trent Harmon was or is? Trent Harmon was the last supposed winner of American Idol. Do we have any American Idol fans in here? Anybody grow up watching that? Yes, yeah, some of you guys remember American Idol. Well, Trent Harmon, there's a big sign outside the city that says, winner of the last American Idol, but we all know that didn't really end, that went to another network and has continued to go on. But Trent was from Amory, and that year was just a phenomenal year for our community because of his run on American Idol. I mean, every week we got to see our local town hero in Hollywood singing and all of these people just applauding and, and uh, supporting him. And so, you know, as they do in American Idol, they have a homecoming. And so that particular Saturday, Trent came and they threw a parade. And y'all, I have never seen so many people lining the streets in a little small town. And Trent comes kind of at the end of the parade and he's riding on a Ford tractor. You know, that whole year they had played up this country boy from Mississippi and how he lived on a farm and wore a cowboy hat and all this stuff. And sure enough, there, they were, there he was on the tractor coming right down the middle of the street and everybody was crowding out into the streets. They were holding signs. And y'all, I've never heard anything louder than thousands of six 
to 11-year-old girls screaming for Trent Harmon. It was a phenomenal event. It was amazing. It was pandemonium. It was chaos. It was very similar to maybe what was happening in this story in Mark's gospel in chapter 11. Imagine the scene. Israel has spent hundreds of years waiting for a messianic king, for God to raise up this descendant of David that would come into Jerusalem, take over the throne of his ancestor David, usher in a kingdom of peace and prosperity, free of all the oppressive governments that Israel had known in the previous years. And so this is the moment that they've been waiting for, the day when Jesus comes to town. Now, Mark's gospel has been leading up to this point. You know, we've spent uh, 10 weeks so far journeying through Mark's gospel, following Jesus, learning more about who he is and what he's come to do for us. And today we kind of come to the final week, beginning with this Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday begins our journey into Holy Week. And as Jesus is coming into town, the crowds are in a frenzy because here is their king. Their king has finally made it. And as Jesus and his disciples approach the holy city, it seems as though Jesus has intentionally organized his own parade. You see, he tells the disciples to go and find this donkey that no one has ever ridden to bring it to him for the parade. Now, up to this point, Jesus has walked his entire ministry. But here we come to this last mile of the journey into the city. And what does he do? He rides into town. And not only just riding into town, but we learn that he begins up on the Mount of Olives and he rides downhill on a donkey. I mean, that was probably a a thrill ride, to say the least, coming into town. But Jesus isn't trying to enter the city to impress some people. He isn't looking for style points. If he was... He would have chosen different transportation. I mean, kings in this time period would come riding into town on white stallions. And so you can imagine that this is the beginning of Passover week in the holy city where thousands of pilgrims were flooding into town. And not only pilgrims, but kings. Pilate would have come to town that week. With all of the pomp and circumstance of a Roman ruler. Preceded by horses and banners and shiny brass helmets and red scarlet clothing and swords and chariots and soldiers. and All of that would have come as a part of Pilate's parade. But not only Pilate, but Herod would have been in town that week too. And we can imagine that he probably came in from the north. With his own procession. And then here's Jesus. With a ragtag band of followers. People laying their everyday garments on the ground. Shaking just branches that they had cut out of the gardens. And and the woods and places like that. And he isn't riding a horse. He, He doesn't have an army. He doesn't have chariots and shiny swords or anything like that. He has This donkey. Why a donkey? Well, you see, Jesus knows that all of the previous kings of Israel, they rode donkeys. It was their mode of transportation because image is everything. Jesus has purposely chosen the donkey like all of the kings of Israel in the past, and he is sending a message. If you didn't know by now, you should. I am a king. I am the long-awaited Messiah. You see, all the kings 
of the Davidic line, including David himself, rode donkeys. And everybody knew this because Zechariah, the prophet of old, prophesied in chapter 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, behold, your king comes to you triumphant and victorious is he. Humble and riding on a donkey. You see, Zechariah prophesied this moment. He prophesied the moment when a new king would come. A Davidic king, the messianic king. And he would be riding on a donkey, just like his ancestors. And so as Jesus comes down the mountain, the people, they line the streets. They throw the cloaks out there and the branches. They're waving. They're rolling out, in essence, the red carpet for Jesus. And passions are running high. Excitement is filling the crowd. And they're shouting these ancient words. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They are shouting what the psalmist have shout when the kings have come to town. And the word Hosanna means Lord save us. And they're acknowledging that God oftentimes ushers in the salvation of his people through these kings. And so Jesus' actions and the response of the crowd, they all suggest Jesus is declaring himself a king. And everybody seems to understand they're all getting in a line and doing what they're supposed to do in this moment. It's sort of like when you see the president of the United States, the newly elected leader, taking his place on the steps of the Capitol building in January, laying his hand on the Bible, And raising the other hand and taking the oath of office. When you see that happening, you know what's taking place, don't you? There's an inauguration happening. There's a new leader that is taking the seat of power. Everybody knows. Everybody knows when they see that motorcade going down the streets of Washington. And going to the National Cathedral. And and people line the streets. We all know what the signs are telling us. And so, the people, they know. It's obvious. Now, what does Jesus do, though, once he gets to town? Does he go to the palace? Does he go to a throne? Does, is he coronated as king? No. He goes to the temple, and he walks around, and then he leaves. It is the most anticlimactic thing that could possibly happen. I mean, everybody is worked up and they're watching. They want to know what Jesus is going to do. They're expecting him to lead a revolt, to gather an army, to lead them to freedom. And instead, he just casually goes to the temple and and then disappears. Everybody just goes home. And I wonder what they're imagining. Well, maybe he'll come back tomorrow. Maybe he's tired. Maybe he needs to rest. And and surely he will come back tomorrow and lead us. But he doesn't. Now, what's the lesson here? What is Jesus trying to demonstrate to us? I think it's this. Jesus seems... To give us a warning in this story. Do not mistake enthusiasm for discipleship. You see, the crowds, they're enthusiastic. They're ready to follow Jesus. But they are misunderstanding the signs. They are misunderstanding what kind of king he really is. You see, on the way into Jerusalem, the disciples have been fussing with each other because they think when they get there that Jesus is going to take his seat of power on a throne. And so they argue about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. 
even they fail to get it. And so Jesus goes to the temple as a sign that, that God is coming to his holy city, but he is going to disrupt everything. He's going to change their expectations. You see, Jesus wants us to know that if we follow this king, it's going to lead us to an unexpected place. And as we follow Jesus through Holy Week, we realize where this journey will go. Calvary. Outside the city. Jesus will be lifted up. But it will be on a cross. He will be given a crown. A crown of thorns. He will be dressed in a purple royal garment. But it will also be crimson stained. With the blood of his own very body. You see he is a king. He has come to save his people but it will look different than they expected you see the crowds who gathered there waving the palm branches you know if if y'all ever seen the uh the musical or the, the the movie rendition of jesus christ superstar you should watch it but there's a scene, it's, it's kind of a spiff on Jesus is, and, and, and how the followers of Jesus, they, they, how fickle they are. And there comes a part in the movie where Jesus does come to Jerusalem and, and they're singing, it's a musical by the way, and the, the crowd is singing, hey Jesus, did you see? I waved. Hey Jesus, didn't you see? I was in that crowd, I waved at you. And you see what they are demonstrating is how Jesus has fans. Just like the Trent Harmons of our world, the Taylor Swifts and all those other famous people that we follow. They have fans. And we all want to be seen by them. Hey, I'm here. (laughs) Look at me. I love you. And so they do that to Jesus. They wave. They celebrate, but as soon as the journey goes in a direction they don't expect, as soon as the road gets a little rough under their feet as they follow as fans, they turn away. And y'all, that's exactly what happens when we read this story about Jesus. You see, those same crowds... That gather there and shout Hosanna and wave. Hey Jesus, we love you. On Good Friday, what do those crowds do? Crucify him. Yeah, they're still shouting. But they've quickly turned. When Jesus doesn't meet their expectations. You see, enthusiasm takes us only so far in life. You see, we all need enthusiasm and passion in following Jesus. And there's nothing wrong with being passionate about following Christ. We need more people like that. But we also need people who are not just fans of Jesus, but are truly following him in discipleship. That are willing to follow the way of Jesus. The way of surrender. The way of taking up the cross. And following where Jesus leads us. You see, enthusiasm says, when you don't meet my expectations and give me what I want, I'm out of here. Y'all, we are, we are like that as well. We're guilty of the same thing. It's easy to follow Jesus when we think it means that he wants to make all our dreams come true and fulfill all of our wants and desires. It's 
God is on my side, then surely Jesus has come to help me be more successful, more fulfilled, or more whatever it is that I want in life. Y'all, that kind of discipleship doesn't know what to do with unanswered prayer. It doesn't know what to do with death instead of healing. It doesn't know what to do with suffering instead of blessings. Tragedy across instead of triumph. When our enthusiasm is high, so is our ambition. We're ready to follow Jesus anywhere. But following Jesus does not mean free ice cream for everybody. You see, sooner or later that we're going to realize that true discipleship calls us to sacrifice. To surrender our will to the will of God. To lay down our pride. To crucify ourselves. So that we're not the center of everything. But instead to realize that God is. You see, true discipleship calls us to wrestle with the mysteries of life. It doesn't offer a pat answer to all of our questions. And also, discipleship is not a constant state of spiritual highs. Because you see, sometimes we walk through the dark valleys. And the question becomes, will we be faithful in those moments? Will we continue to follow Jesus when God seems silent or distant? You see, all of these are elements of what true discipleship is all about. We've already heard Jesus call us to this life. He says, those who want to be first must be last. Those who want to gain life must lose their life. They must surrender their self-interest, their self-centeredness. And Jesus calls us to that journey. It is more than just waving palm branches and shouting Hosanna. Really, discipleship is about what you do when you walk out these doors. Because anybody can come to church and fill a pew and sing a song. But what do you do when you go out? Do you still follow Jesus wherever you go? And we all know where Jesus is leading us. He leads us to the cross. And there's two things I want you to remember about the cross where Jesus is leading us. The first thing is, is that true discipleship always leads us to the place of repentance. To the place where we kneel before that cross. Because I don't know about you, but when I see that cross, it's like looking in a mirror. When I see Jesus dying on the cross, I see us putting him there. I see me putting Jesus there because of my sin. So when I see the cross, I see the ugliness of our human condition. Because we put him there. We did that to the king of glory. We did that to God's son. We are all guilty. Because we all have sin. And the cross reminds me of that, that I am a sinner in need of God's redeeming grace. What he does there, he did for me and he did for you. That is the price that he was willing to pay. 
That's the kind of king and Lord that he is. And so I come to the cross. I am brought to the place of repentance. But you know, there's something else about that cross. And I'm reminded that true discipleship always leads us to the cross. And at the cross, what we truly see is an outpouring of God's grace, don't we? We see grace upon grace. We see the depths of the love that God has for us, that He was willing to go to those lows and depths because of that love. The cross is an amazing and profound statement by God that says to us, I am willing to suffer for you. I am willing to bear your shame and your guilt because I love you. I am willing to plunge myself into the depths of human sin and darkness in order to reveal the power of my grace to break that power of darkness in your life. And Jesus does. He goes all the way down. He descends through the suffering and the passion of the weak, including execution. And then he goes into the depths of the grave. He goes full force into death itself so that he can deliver us from it. Y'all, this is what the cross shows us. It's what I see in the cross. I see grace. I see salvation. I see forgiveness of my sins. And a grace that is greater than my brokenness. And it causes me to say, what wondrous love is this that God has for us. Y'all, I cannot look at the cross without realizing that for myself. Sin had broken me utterly in the early stages of my life. But it was when I came to Jesus, to the foot of his cross, that my life was changed. That new life actually started in that moment, in that turning. And so I cannot look at the cross without recommitting my life to Jesus. Y'all, the journey of Holy Week doesn't follow a path from triumph to triumph, from Palm Sunday to Easter. There's a whole bunch of stuff that happens in the middle that we don't need to miss out on. Because the path will lead us to Good Friday. To the cross, the place of repentance and grace. And so I hope you make that journey this week. I hope that you find yourself walking the road with Jesus from triumph to passion and death and brokenness and ultimately to the place of resurrection life. This is the way of discipleship. This is the way. May we walk in it. I'm going to invite the band to come up. We're going to close out our service this morning with singing Who You Say I Am. And I just pray that as we begin Holy Week together, That we would all begin to put our eyes squarely on Jesus and his cross. By the way, there's a cross back there. That's why I keep looking up there. (laughs) But there's also one here too. Y'all, that's where we're looking to this week. This is the way to life. And I pray that we're all renewed in our faith this week. In our appreciation what God has done for us. Let's pray.
God, thank you so much for this week. It is such a special and holy week for us. And we know that we are all faced with the question that we're about to sing about. Who do we say that you are? Who are you? What does all of this mean? Why a cross? Why for us? Lord, help us to wrestle with those questions. And come to understand that it was all for us. It shows us the way. That you call us to live our lives. May we follow you, Lord. May we proclaim you as our glorious King. Our resurrected Lord. The one who has triumphed over all of our enemies. Sin. Death. And hell. And you show us the way to eternal life. It's in surrender. And let us do that, I pray this week. In Jesus' name.